Welcome to the Fast Leader Podcast, where we uncover the leadership life hacks that help you to experience breakout performance faster and rocket to success. And now, here's your host, customer and employee engagement expert and certified emotional intelligent practitioner, Jim Rimbach. Call Center Coach develops and unites the next generation of call center leaders. Through our e-learning and community, individuals gain knowledge and skills in the six core competencies that is the blueprint that develops high-performing call center leaders. Successful supervisors do not just happen. So go to callcentercoach.com to learn more about enrollment and download your copy of the Supervisor Success Path eBook now. Okay, Fast Leader Legion, today I'm excited because we are going to have a fantastic discussion uh, and use history to do really what it's been intended to do, and that is to help us to learn and then do better. John Benedict J.B. Steenkamp grew up in Amsterdam with two older brothers and a passion for history. His parents instilled in him the values of hard work and taking responsibility. His greatest mentor on everything concerning leadership was his late father, who was a businessman, dean at a technical university, and a leading politician. His father took his leadership cues from historical leaders, and before he was even a teenager, his father spent his spare time explaining to him what he can learn from historical figures. JB began his career as an assistant professor of marketing at Wenningen University in the Netherlands, and he held leadership positions in a political party at three universities in the Netherlands and Belgium and professional organizations before being hired as chairman of the marketing department for the University of North Carolina's Keenan Flagler Business School in 2006. JB has written several book business cases on inspired leadership, and he felt the urge to write a book on leadership in which he combined his passion for history, his marketing knowledge, and his leadership knowledge and experiences. The book's title is Time to Lead, Lessons for Today's Leaders from Bold Decisions that Changed History. In today's time of global crisis and obvious lack of faith in leaders at all levels, more than ever we need to and can learn from the great men and women in the recent and more distant past who often faced much greater challenges. As The Economist wrote, those who have passed through the fire surely have something to teach modern day managers. JB is a Knox Massey Distinguished Professor at UNC and co-founder and executive director of AMARC, a nonprofit institute that bridges the world between academia and practice and has held countless and has helped countless uh, academics to do work that actually matters to business. JB currently lives in Chapel Hill with his wife, Valerie, and they have four kids scattered throughout the world and three grandchildren. JB, JB Steenkamp, are you ready to help us get over the hump? Absolutely. Thank you very much for the introduction and look forward to talking to you. Well, I, you know, I'm glad you're here. We've already had a great discussion that I hope we can bring on to this interview. But before we get into all of that, can you please share with Fast Leader Legion listeners or Fa- the Fast Leader Show listeners what your current passion is so that we can get to know you even better? Well, my current passion is, first of all, I am passionate about this book and passionate about history. So I now try to get this book under the attention of people because I do believe it has a, it has a message. And I have started to work on a next book. It's going to take some time. And that next book uh, will be provisionally titled Transformative Female Leadership in History. So I combine the history and the leadership. And I now want to, uh, to put a lens in that book, but there will be a few years. So uh, um, females have been relatively underemphasized in the leadership literature, and there have been a lot of very important leaders from times immemorial till the present day, and that's another uh, interest of mine. Well, I, and to me, and even when you started talking about that, being at the you know, the UNC and probably having access to the entire 14 school system when you start looking at the leaders of tomorrow, they are female. Uh, Many of them are female, uh, especially in the undergraduate uh, population. The MBA population, uh, females about one third, and there is a hope to increase that towards more to 50%. So hopefully uh, your works are going to have generational impacts, just like uh, the people who you covered in this book. And what I found quite interesting is how you segmented this book into seven different parts, which address many of the things that we hear about in the leadership community and world 
uh, in regards to the types of leaders we should be. And you, you section it off into adaptive leadership, uh, which is identify or modifying according to the circumstances, persuasive leadership, which is changing the minds of followers, directive leadership, which is defining the marching orders, disruptive leadership, which is breaking from the past, authentic leadership, which is setting the example, servant leadership, which is putting your followers first, and charismatic leadership, which is buy into the leader and then follow their vision. Can you explain, can you explain though, um, how you present all of these leadership styles in the book? So it came about that I first identified a number of key leaders that made a decision that really changed world history. But, you know, then I had a long list of leaders and, and that can be interesting, but I wanted to bring structure to it. That's where, let's say, my academic mind comes to, uh, uh, to the table. And so I read up in the leadership literature and I kind of thought about it a little bit, thought about my own experience. And then I came up with these seven categories, which cover a lot of what is, what is possible. And I tried to place each leader in a category. Now, then it turned out to be that for some categories I had, had very few, so I needed to look at for additional examples, but for other categories, I had too many, you know, and then I wanted to be it a little bit balanced. So that is the combination of some of the leadership thinking together with my historical knowledge, kind of combining them brought me to this particular set of leaders. Well, and talking about these particular set of leaders, I mean, you, you call them, uh, you know, a cast of, of, of characters <laughs> uh, and, and they're, they come from all di- our figures um, and they come from all different areas of the world in different time periods. Um, I mean, so there was everything from Margaret Thatcher all the way to, um, you know, going back to the, the rise of the Franks um, at that time. You know, going, you know, of course, covering Martin Luther King Jr. and Nelson Mandela, uh, Jackie Fisher, which, you know, some people may, may not know about him uh, that are from uh, North America. But all of these different people, like you said, have impacted the world and history. As we say, why do we study history so that we don't repeat some of the mistakes and, and we take some benefit from the findings. But I start looking at today's world and I start looking at the volatility and I start looking at the complexity, and I'm wondering, do we have to be all of these people? Well, as an academic, I would say, yes, be everything together. But that doesn't make any sense because humans do not have everything together. Um, Say, for example, it is very difficult to be a servant leader and to be very directive. It's possible, but very few will have that. No, actually, you don't have to have everything because as I show in in this, this book, you can be very successful having particular leadership traits. So you don't have to have everything uh, together. And that offers a lot of hope. But I think in November, people will have to choose the kind of leader that they want for the country. Now, as we all know, people think very differently about the kind of leader that the country needs. So that means you and I may not have the same idea about this. And that's why we have democratic elections. Now, I have an idea about the kind of leader that the country needs, but I'm pretty sure that some other people have other ideas. Well, even as you're saying that, I still even start taking it down to an organization that I work for or one that I'm running, and I start thinking about the culture. You know, that's really what we start talking about. And, and also, n- knowing the type of dominant you know, leader you are, uh, knowing and, and, be, you know, and mm-hmm. not, uh, I guess I'd say, trying to be something else and then therefore apologizing for it. It's just saying, look, this is who we are, and this is what we do, and this is what we believe in, and then finding others that believe in the same thing. Jim, that is exactly the point. So in the foreword to, the, uh, to my book, General Holt, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for the, um, for the Air Force, uh, wrote a very insightful point. General Holt is a leader, a, a great leader, actually, of the U.S. Armed Forces. He says, we can have a certain culture and we, we select people that that go with it. We cannot make people into something that they are not. So what people have to do is they have to select actually the kind of organizational culture that they feel comfortable with. And don't try to change yourself into something that you are not. It is not going to work. Well, even when you say that, I start thinking about me, even even as I'm, say I'm from a candidate, right? And I'm looking for an organization. I, I start wondering whether or not people thinking from a general perspective 
have actually been able to even identify that in themselves. So how, how do we cut through that as an issue to make sure that we're making the right hiring decision and then therefore nurturing that and reinforcing and setting expectations based on that? Well, a lot starts actually with the CEO. Uh, CEO meaning a business, but that can also be the boss of an NGO or of a political leader for that matter, or a military leader. That is that the military, I'm sorry, not the military, the, the leader in general of an organization, he or she sets the tone for the organization. Now, there has to be more than only the leader. But if the leader is doing one thing and is essentially preaching a very different gospel, Honestly, that, that doesn't work. It starts at the top. You know, as, as President Obama said in, in the past, you know, uh, I think the buck stops here or something like that. Uh, so ultimately, you know, the top leader is, is ultimately the person responsible. Um, but it has to be fed, fed through the organization, through HR departments. And what I do in the book is to help people to generate some more awareness of their own leadership qualities. So I, I have self-assessment tests that I have at the back of the book that people can just answer honestly, you know, do it by yourself, nobody else sees it, answer honestly these questions, and then I identify based on these answers, okay, you are uh, high on this aspect, low on that aspect, go to that part of the book to study it a little bit more, because Actually, when I did the test myself, I discovered some of the uh, uh, of issues about myself that they said, hey, actually, I didn't think that that was true. But now that I think of it, actually, it is true, but I did not want it to be true. So people can just do an assessment of yourself because every success of a human being starts with an assessment of your own strengths and weaknesses. Well, and, and even as you're saying that, I would dare to say that that somewhat changes through time. And you talk about six core qualities uh, that are also important. And again, we hear about these a lot in society and in literature and different, you know, people and what they focus in on and heck, even reporting. And so we hear about intelligence, you know, that could be a um, different, you know, actual, you know, smarts, IQ, um, self-confidence, integrity, sociability, sociability, emotional intelligence, humility, and grit. So am I to understand that if you are, if I was to think about this, you know, analytically or mathematically, that mm -hmm. if I take these particular elements and based on my strengths and, and, and weaknesses in these, that I therefore become one of these types of leaders, adaptive, persuasive and all, is that, is that how I should look at this or no? No, actually, um, uh, my apologies fell out. Um, it is not. What you can find is these different qualities to more or less degree in each type of leader. What actually my book showed, and I did not know that beforehand, is that you don't need most of those. Now, if you have nothing, then there is an issue. But for example, some people were very intelligent, uh, proven like Alexander the Great was extremely intelligent. Uh, others were not particularly intelligent. Like one reader, which is his monumental impact, uh, uh, Henry Campbell Bannerman, which some Americans may not be familiar with, so there are some interesting learnings, are, for example, not. Some people have high humility, which, you know, people say humility is great. Uh, St. Peter had high humility. Other people, like Jackie Fisher that you mentioned earlier, or the goal uh, for very low on humility, and they changed uh, history. There are some corporate leaders at this point, which I suspect have low humility, even some political leaders. The one thing that I found that every successful leader needs to have, there's only one characteristic, and that is grit. The other things, of course, it's all nice to have, absolutely. But grit is essentially, and to understand what grit is, um, just look at the, uh, the song by Billy Ocean, uh, when the going get tough, the tough get going. Essentially, that lyric says any, everything that you, know, uh, that you need to know about grit. It is, it is, it is, it is focus, it is self-confidence, a motivation to succeed, and resilience. If you have that, if you have grit, that actually, without that, it's really difficult to be a strong leader. Okay, so when you start talking about grit, I, I start thinking about other things as well. Um, resolve, uh, resilience, um, you know, several different elements associated with grit. And yes. so 
I, I start thinking about the, the complexities of all of these different things. So and mm -hmm. I, I have to start thinking about when, when you start studying all these leaders and you go on through even the, the assessments that you're talking about, I have to figure me out first. And then I have to figure out my place and where I am, the organization with, the organization I'm running, the culture I'm creating, all of those types of things. And then I start thinking about developing others in the process. So how, how do I go about actually pulling people in and developing their leadership skills and their ability to now uh, start, you know, work collaborating and working together to create a better organization? It depends very much on the organization that we are talking about. Say, for example, when you are in the U U.S. military, um, what you need to have as an officer is a combination of directive leadership and servant leadership. Directive leadership is very clear because there is a moment that you have to give orders and that the people are following the orders. You cannot have a group discussion when you're under fire. Servant leadership is important in the U.S. military, but mind you, it is not common in the military in Iraq. It is not common in the military of China. And I'm not saying that those guys, or Iraq is not so strong, but China is, 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 is weak. But the U.S. military culture has essentially you as an officer make sure that you take care first of your men before taking care of yourself. Now, That is something, therefore, if you are in a senior leadership, what you are looking for is people that have the combination of, of having a, a, a ability to be directive, so they have to have a certain degree of self-confidence and in their own competence, but they do, should not have a feeling of being entitled. Entitled because they have this higher rank, Therefore, I am entitled to all kinds of perks. Now, of course, they are entitled to different perks. You know, they have more stars on their shoulders. But it is a, it is a mindset. But there are other, uh, there are, I would say there are other comp uh, organizational cultures where perhaps, you know, servant leadership is not that particularly important. Uh, where... Honestly speaking, there may be cultures where actually disruptive leadership is something that you're looking for. If you're looking, for example, in a high-tech company where technological developments go really fast, you know, if it is very static, not so much of an issue. If it goes very fast, you need to have people that have a mindset to be able to disrupt their business, their own lives, because as a, it is related to, to what you are doing, and that's not given. To most people. So, for example, one of the people that they interviewed for my book, he was an extremely successful uh, leader at a large uh, oil company. But that's not a very disruptive business. But he also said, I'm not a disruptive leader. I, I am, by, by my personality, I don't like disruptive uh, events. I don't like disruptive leadership. But he was a very successful directive leader. So, you see, but those same qualities. You know, perhaps if you are you know, in the leadership of Google uh, or Netflix or so, may not be so good because that, that, those are companies that have to reinvent themselves a lot. So fortunately for different people, because there are many different organizations uh, around the world, um, there are different things. I, I would not be suitable for the military because I just don't like anybody else to tell me what to do. Many directive leaders don't want to be directed by others themselves. So Margaret Thatcher is a good example. Great directive leader, one of the greatest in world history. But she hated to be told what others want to do. Now, that's actually very common. Now, I, I'm maybe also a little bit more of a directive leader than, say, some other kind of leadership. So I think that's, that's fair to say. So I can't go in the military. Well, as you're saying that, I start also thinking about one issue that is, you know, a, a real issue with, with a lot. Um, of organizations of today is this whole creative thinking and innovation opportunity and issue. And so what I mean by that is if I start creating this particular environment and culture and I'm not the military, it's a different story. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I need to have, you know, the diversity of views and thinking and types of leadership, but then I also need to include that. And I think that's the bridge that needs to be passed. It's not just having the diversity, but it's including the diversity you know, how, how do I prevent myself from having the problem of groupthink, right? Everybody thinks the same. Everybody's the same type of leader. And therefore, 
Now we're stifled and we can't be creative and innovative. Or we're so darn disruptive, we can't get anything executed. Um, well, fortunately, even if some people are disruptive, um, there is still a lot of variation. So the, the seven categories that I'm talking about, you know, in America, there are 330 million people. It's not that they can be pigeonholed into, into one thing. So you have people that are very dis uh, directive, like Margaret Thatcher, and you have people that are perhaps a little uh, directive, like me, and I don't want to compare myself to the great British Prime Minister. But the thing is, what you need is, and you have to also to look at different parts of the organization. There may be parts of the organization where you need not so much directive leaders uh, or disruptive leaders even. Uh, say, for example, even in the like, like airline industry. Um, when you're talking about maintenance, which is a big part, uh, you may not really need disruptive leaders in maintenance. And uh, those are, you need ma the leaders there as well. But you may need a disruptive leader when it comes to heading the strategy department. So within a company, you still have different tasks. But take, for example, one, exa one area that I'm fairly familiar with, that is uh, the area of R&D, new product development. Their group think is about the worst that you can have. There, what you need is a fair amount of dis disruptive uh, leaders. You may not need them as much in HR, perhaps, and certainly not in maintenance. So there is, again, in a company, you have different groups of people for different kinds of jobs. Okay, so when I start thinking about all of these leaders that you have covered in this book and how they have impacted or, or actually represented all of these different types of leadership and all these different traits, um, I start thinking of some of them rising to the top as your favorites. Is there one or two that you like that you'd like to point out? Um, yes, I, I would say I have many favorites, but um, uh, one person that has impacted my personal life very much, in, in indirectly, I would say, but a lot, has been uh, British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. She has... Um, I do believe she, has, she was a great leader and I admire her as one of the greatest post-Second World War leaders. Um, so when she came to power in 1979, um, I was an undergraduate student and in the Netherlands, and it was a suffocating uh, kind of general wisdom of, of essentially socialism and um, a, a welfare system. So essentially, uh, there was no no incentive essentially to, to excel and to perform hard because it was all kind of kind of flattened out so which did not appeal to me very much margaret thatcher was the first to break through that and president reagan came a year a year thereafter but margaret thatcher was the first what she did actually so her life is very inspiring to many people also now also women so she broke sexism which actually was very strong especially I would say in whole British politics, but certainly also in her own conservative party. She broke through elitism, which is very strong in Britain because she did not go to the Eatons, etc., of this world. And she broke through the suffocating power of the, of the unions. Britain was the sick man of Europe at the time. At the time that she left office in 1990, Britain was, uh, was strong and actually Hardly any of the things that she changed in those years had been undone when Labour came to power afterwards. And for me, she has been so important because Europe, after she came to power, started to shift away from suffocating socialism and, and, and social welfare towards more the rewarding initiative and, and, and accomplishment, performance, etc. So that is why... I, Margaret Thatcher, I think, objectively has been very impactful, but I also link it to my personal wife, why she has been so impactful for me. I was liberated after that. A second? Well, person, actually, I, actually, before we go into that yeah. second person, I, I would like to ask a question, because in the book you wrote something about her husband trying to influence her to leave the position uh, sooner than she did. You also talked about her height of fame and the the, the amount of adoration and respect that she had and that she should have left the office sooner than she did. Can you explain or lighten us a little bit about that? Um, I think that 
that's a great point. Essentially, um, it is true. When she left, she was forced out of office by her own conservative MPs because at the end, people had had enough of her. Now, um, because she was a very strong personality, but over time, she became, let's say, more and more only, uh, only relying on herself and less and less on other people. Now, that is something that is very common. So there is a good reason why in America we have it to term limit on the presidential elections because politicians have the tendency to remain in office far too long they have the tendency to think that they are indispensable and that is from Brezhnev in the Soviet Union if we can still remember it Kohl in Germany, Merkel essentially had stayed too long but now because of COVID essentially it is for her a lucky break because otherwise she would have left and everybody said oh my god happy she's out, now COVID is for her actually, uh, okay, cutting back in the game because she has done that, that quite well. Politicians stay in office too long and the longer you stay at the top of the greasy pole, the more you're starting to believe that you are right and everybody else is wrong. And that is nothing to do with that. It is the wisdom of the two terms in America. Okay, so now the next person who has influenced you the most. Um, a second person that has... It's, it's, let's say, affected me a lot and, and uh, I admire a lot is President Mandela of uh, South Africa. Um, because, um, so South Africa uh, was be before 1994 under the apartheid uh, regime. And what Mandela had done is, I mean, it's really amazing. And Mandela, by the way, was deeply affected by King. So uh, Martin Luther King affected Mandela in his thinking very much, just like King was affected by Gandhi. That's how your great historical leaders are deeply affected by other historical leaders. And what Mandela was able to do is to first overcome his own hatred, because he had been terribly treated by the, uh, by the government and uh, imprisoned and everything, overcome his own hatred and then reach out and essentially gotten South Africa to a post-apartheid democratic South Africa um, in a way that everybody, I was in the 80s, uh, you know, and we all knew that if apartheid would collapse, South Africa would drown in a sea of blood because of all the pent-up hatred, etc. And Mandela was the only person to defuse that. And he could only defuse it because he overcame his own hatred. And that is something that is amazing. And again, Jim, these, these, these are not saints. It is not like, 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 uh, like Christ or St. Paul or whatever. These are people, Mandela, Thatcher. If I say they could be you or me in the sense that those are, those are be real people that overcome their own problems and, and, and sexism, racism in, in, in case of President Mandela. And they left the world a, a, a better place and, and, these these things can happen also today. Well, and okay, so for me, you know, and, and you're, and I truly, I truly believe what you just said is true. And I also think about that when I start talking about organizations and impacting and the experience internally and externally. And so I think it's often difficult for many of us to, you know, ha understand the translative property uh, and the influential property of many of these things that we are seeing and that you witnessed and that you researched within these historical leaders and the impact they had on the world. So, you know, how can I take what I'm learning from this book and about leadership and these traits and these styles and all of that and impact the employee and the customer experience? I think the first stage is um, to read the book, do the test at the end of the book, because you cannot change anybody unless you first start to analyze, understand yourself. You, you cannot change anybody unless you actually understand what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses. And then my advice is not to shore up your weaknesses unless, I mean, they're completely unacceptable, but play to your strengths because there you're going to make the difference. And then what you have to do is then to see, okay, am I in the right organization given my strengths? So is this the organization that, that, that suits me? Now, um, you may perhaps conclude, no, actually, I should better go to another organization. And that is, that is good. But if you say, okay, 
Now I understand myself. What do you, what can I do differently? Because you analyze what I do in this test and that you can do is, okay, what would you like to be? And what are you currently? Where are big gaps? I like to be really like this, but I am only like this. So I like to be really a disruptive leader, but actually I'm not so much of a disruptive leader. Then I give indications, okay, what you can do, but, but because you are not the first one that has had this issue. You can learn from other people, just like, like, like uh, Mandela learned from Dr. King. So what did these other people do? And then work hard in changing some of it yourself. And the, that is not going to be an overnight process. Because it is not going to be overnight, you better start today rather than tomorrow because it is going to take some time. But what then helps is a final thing is, and um, what I also found in this book is that all the successful leaders had an overarching goal which actually animated their lives. And um, so, yes, they had some sub-goals, but they had an overarching goal. For example, for Margaret Thatcher, the overarching goal was essentially make Britain a strong nation again, in economically, culturally, socially, and also militarily. Now, um, others had other, uh, other things. Um, so, if you have that overarching goal, then what you need to do is, okay, and that's what I've done in my life. I made the decision uh, early on. I say, okay, if that is the overarching goal, then, and I'm here, which kind of steps can I take, intermediate steps to reach that overarching goal? So, for example, if you, um, if, if you aspire to be, uh, say, the... The, the leader of a, of, of a big church, um, which requires probably servant leadership, um, and you are not so strong on servant leadership, which many of them are not, okay, can I read, can I perhaps also take some courses on servant leadership? You don't take a course in something else, like directive leadership, that is great for the military, but not if you are in an NGO, for example. So take the courses, read the books, study the kind of things that help you getting from where you are now to where you want to be. If there is one thing, at least in my life, which has been uh, probably the, the most important factor in my success in my life is, is very simple. I have been extremely goal-directed. Meaning that, okay, I set a goal, I'm here, I set a goal, and I do not start tomorrow, I do not start today, I start right now. Essentially, getting from here to there to achieve that goal. And that is something where a number of businessmen are very good, but actually a number of businessmen are not. If you would ask them, what is really your goal in your life? And, and I'm talking about professional goal, because you can also have goals as a father or a mother, whatever, but of course, I'm not talking about that. It wouldn't really necessarily know. Well, as you're talking, I start thinking of, okay, this is a journey. This is a step. This is, I need other people to collaborate with all these different factors. And, and we look for inspiration on the show to help us stay focused so that we can achieve. Uh, and one of the things that we look at to help us do that are quotes. Now, it's definitely studying all these historical figures and many of the other figures that you have studied, you know, is yeah. there a quote or two that you'd like that you can share? Um, I must say that what I want to, uh, uh, to give is a quote from a, the person that I admire very much. So that's, that's a quote that I give, and that is Margaret Thatcher. And what she said, I quote her now, any leader has to have a certain amount of steel in them. So I am not that put out being called the Iron Lady. And... To me, that is not for everybody that will be an inspiring quote. For me, that is an inspiring quote because you, as I said, any leader has to have a certain amount of steel in them. And that has to do with the resilience. Resilience, and you, we talked about it a little bit earlier, is very key component of grit. Uh, that is, any person in, in their lives are going to get into some trouble. Uh, that's unfortunate. Some people are going to get into more trouble than other ones. But actually, one thing that is also fair to say is that the higher your position is, the more trouble you're going to look at. 
because simply speaking, with a higher position, you're going to face a lot bigger problems than if you have a lower position. So if people say, and, and some people in this show may have uh, really some significant headwinds, I would advise them, you know, perhaps read the chapter on Margaret Thatcher. And if you have a little bit of time, take a biography on, uh, on Thatcher. You know, that's a lot longer, of course, than a book chapter. So, but the thing is, the, the, the steely determination of a woman like she, I think that helps about anybody. Well, I, I, I wish I had more of her steel. Well, and I also think that, you know, part of that additional, that other side of that quote, and when she gets past that, you know, is to say, okay, I accept that I am this way and I'm good with that. <laughs> I believe, Jim, you are absolutely, I love that because the, she has been, as, as, as you allude to, she, people, uh, you know, reproached her for being the Iron Lady. And she kind of said, essentially, I accept that. Not everybody is going to like that. Well, you know, the thing is, Jim, I can tell you one thing. A leader that is liked by everybody, I, this is dangerous to say, but I would argue is a good chance of not being a good leader. Well, yeah, I, I agree with that. However, though, you get pushed and swayed and talking about the grit. That's where the grit comes in. You, you, yeah. to, you know what? I, you know, I, not everybody is going to be, you know, w- wanting to, to, to be part of, you know, the culture that I'm trying to create here. And, and you know what? That's okay. Okay. But so, but, the, the, but, the thing is, Jim, that is just like not everybody is going to like your show. And uh, they are misguided, of course, but not everybody's going to like your show. But that is great. That is okay. It is far better to have and possibly a so- slightly smaller group of people that that love you than a big group that is lukewarm about you. Because lukewarm followers in the organization, the moment there is any problem, they run for the exit. But people that love you, so people that you have re- you've really touched, they stick with you when they go and get stuff. Well, and you know, talking about a goal, your goal should never be apathy. No, 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 no. Well, apathy and leadership uh, is, is about, or at least impactful leadership, that's about the uh, polar opposites. <laughs> Got that right. Okay. So, however, you know, we have a lot of learnings and, and things that, you know, we, we you know, ta- cause us to course correct. And we talk about life lessons and getting over the hump on the show. Is there a time where you've gotten over the hump that you can share? Um. Yes, um, let me g- give you an example. That is, um, so in academia, so the, 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 how, how success, how you are evaluated is based on the number of academic publications. Those that tend to be written for other academics, not very impactful in practice because they are full of mathematical formulas and all that kind of stuff. So about 10, 15 years ago, I, I hit him because I had written so many of these publications that, okay, I can write another one. But how is that really going to move the needle? How am I going to have any additional impact by writing another publication? Now, all the performance criteria said you should not change course because the university, summer support, promotions, everything else, uh, sal- uh, promotion I could make, but salary increase, etc., is based on these number of academic publications. But I found actually, I, I became really kind of dispirited, demotivated. And um, then I reinvented myself. Um, so I started to write uh, business books, which by the way, so... Business books are books that are written for managers. So not for academics, for managers. In those books, you cannot hide behind mathematical formulas because people say, you know, okay, the formula is great, but what am I going to do differently based on, based on this? You know, actually, I learned that the hard way for when I was doing something for Procter Gamble and I presented some uh, statistical formulas and people said, this is great, JP, you know, really good stuff, but tell me actually, what does it mean for me selling me more tight? I said, well, that was kind of difficult. So, you know, I kind of, I got some of these triggers early on. So then, I ch- decided to change directory. I wrote uh, uh, a bunch of cases for you know, business cases that are being used in teaching, a number of them in inspired leadership. I wrote uh, four books. 
uh, written for managers. And um, so I changed actually trajectory um, from being a traditional academic to becoming a thought leader. And and these books have been actually, that was, of course, encouraging. They were very well received. They got prizes. They have translated into seven languages and, and those kind of things. But the, 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 the thing is, I reinvented myself from a marketing, traditional marketing academic to um, a management, to, to, uh, to a business thought leader. Now, you could say, well, you know, isn't that normal? No, because actually, first of all, the university doesn't, doesn't like it. It's, so it is actually, you go against the performance criteria of your own organization. How crazy can you be? And the second thing is, it's actually really risky to, to do something different. Is it going to be successful? Do people, will people like it? And most academics don't. They keep on doing the same thing. And I'm not criticizing them, but it, there is a reason why most academics at a certain age don't do very much anymore because you know i'm not, no longer motivated so to me that was a hump it's uh, i ran into something that others ran into and i decided to reinvent myself well and i'm glad you did because i've really enjoyed uh, your book and also too i started thinking about and you even mentioned it yourself I start thinking about goals, you know, right? You talk about very goal oriented. And um, I think it's important for us to learn from others in regards to their goals and, and what they think about them. So is are one of those goals that you can share with us? Um, yes, I, if, if I'm, um, if I'm honest, I was, uh, when I was uh, 23, I decided I, I wanted to be at the top of whatever profession I would choose. And in those, that was either at the, in those days, the, the CEO of a large Dutch company. I was in the Netherlands in those days, you know, you wouldn't hire foreigners. Uh, or I would be in the top of, because I was interested always in marketing, at least academically speaking, uh, in the top of the marketing profession. And, okay, so from 23 on, I worked on being on top of the marketing profession, but then I had the speed hump because I was at top of the marketing profession. And I kind of thought, well, actually, this goal is not sufficiently ambitious. I want to be a thought leader. And yeah, being a marketing scholar can be an element of that. Yes, you don't want to be only to uh, selling hot air, not at all then to a thought leader and then the next step that was more recently that they said actually I, I want to to move out of marketing I, I really want to move into uh, leadership which has marketing elements in it as I in the book so it is by reinventing myself I've been able to keep myself energized and the fast leader legion wishes you the very best now before we move on let's get a quick word from our sponsor an even better place to work is an easy-to-use solution that gives you a continuous diagnostic on employee engagement along with integrated activities that will improve employee engagement and leadership skills in everyone. Using this award-winning solution is guaranteed to create motivated, productive, and loyal employees who have great work relationships with our colleagues and your customers. To learn more about an even better place to work, visit beyondmorale.com forward slash better. All right, here we go, Fast Leader Legion. It's time for the Hump Day Hoedown. Okay, JB, the Hump Day Hoedown is a part of our show where you give us good insights fast. So I'm going to ask you several questions. And your job is to give us robust yet rapid responses that are going to help us move onward and upward faster. JB Steen Camp, are you ready to hoe down? I try it. All right. So what is holding you back from being an even better leader today? A lack of time. Um, I, I would like to give people more uh, personalized attention, and I seem to have so many balls in the air. What is the best leadership advice you have ever received? Uh, what my mother taught me. Stay true to yourself. And what do you believe is one of your secrets that helps you lead in business or life? Um, extreme goal directedness. And what is one of the best tools that you use that helps you be more effective? My ability to conceptualize, to see relationships between disparate events in meetings that other people do not see. And that is because of my study of history. And what would be one book that you'd recommend to our Legion? It could be from any genre. Of course, we're going to put a link to Time to Lead on your show notes page as well. I, uh, unfortunately, I, I, it sounds self-serving, but I do think, honestly, that Time to Lead would be, uh, at, at this point, that would be the kind of the uh, suggestion that I would give. 
All right, I'm not going to let you get off that easy. You got to give me one other recommendation. <laughs> uh, okay, okay, that, uh, that's absolutely because I'm that, recommending your book, JB. <laughs> okay, uh, that's absolutely fine. Um, then what I would um, see, let me kind of think about it. Um, I would suggest President Mandela's book, Long Walk to Freedom. Essentially, it's an autobiography about the struggles that he went himself through to get to the place where he could lead the nation to its freedom. Okay, Fast Leader Legion, you can find links to that and other bonus information from today's show by going to fastleader.net slash J.B. Steenkamp. Okay, J.B., this is my last hump day hold on question. Imagine you were given the opportunity to go back to the age of 25 and take the knowledge and skills that you have now back with you, but you can't take it all. You can only take one. So what skill or piece of knowledge would you take back with you and why? I would take a piece of knowledge, and that is that success does not equate happiness. When I was 25, I thought that being successful would automatically mean that I would be happy. I have learned the hard way that that is not the case. I still, I still value success. That's not the point. But I do not believe that I will be happy because I have success. JB, I had fun with you today. Can you please share with the Fast Leader Legion how they can connect with you? Yes. Yes. Um, so please uh, reach out to me on uh, uh, LinkedIn and um, I would be extremely happy to connect with you and keep you uh, you know, informed about the things. I regularly uh, put posts there, articles and, uh, and other things. So send me an invite and for connect and I will accept you. JB Steenkamp, thank you for sharing your knowledge and wisdom. The Fast Leader Legion honors you and thanks you for helping us get over the hump. Thank you for joining me on the Fast Leader Show today. For recaps, links from every show, special offers, and access to download and subscribe, if you haven't already, head on over to fastleader.net so we can help you move onward and upward faster. 